Welcome to Dialogue, a true crime conversation. I'm your host, Rebecca Sebastian, and we are moving along in our series that I'm calling Cult Adjacent. And what better guest than today's? Amanda Montel is the author of the book Cultish, The Language of Fanaticism, which came out just a couple of months ago. She is also the host of a podcast called Sounds Like a Cult. Amanda is a linguist and approaches all of these topics through the lens of language, which I find absolutely fascinating and also a really unique perspective. Cults are really serious and really dark, which is why I am so glad there's so much laughter in this episode because there's also some comedy in them. And there's also some comedy in realizing how we ourselves participate in cultish behavior and cultish thinking in many places of our life. Please enjoy this podcast and go to the show notes for a link to her book and her podcast. Amanda, thank you so much for killing the small talk. Amanda, I am so excited to have you on the Dialogue Podcast. Hello and welcome. Uh, Hello, greetings. Greetings. Uh, Great headphones. You inspired me to put my big, big Leia buns on. (laughs) They are big Leia buns. Yeah, we're in the cult of wearing the world's most gigantic headphones. I feel fine about it. I feel great about it. I expect people to start following suit immediately upon release of this episode. Yeah, if you're not wearing gigantic headphones, then you cannot ascend to the next evolutionary level above human. And are you sorry about it? Are you even listening? Can you even hear anything if you're not wearing these? So welcome. I'm thrilled to have you. And I've been thinking about meeting you and how to say what I'm about to say and make sure it comes out the right way, like the compliment that it is. So (laughs) here goes. I can't wait. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I know. What a setup. Your book. And your podcast both. I like them so much. It makes me a little bit mad. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, I have so many people who I love so much. They make me mad. Yeah, that's how I'm feeling. And I'm like, it's the conversation I meant to have about cults. And and she she did it. And it should be you. You are way more qualified. I'm so glad you did it. But let me tell you, having you here is is really exciting because I I loved cultish, the language of fanaticism. And then I found out you had a podcast. I actually didn't know that. I got the book first. So then to find out you're doing this in a fun way on a podcast was like, oh, for come on. No, I'm grotesquely underqualified to do everything that I'm doing, which is very cult leader-esque of me. But (laughs) I appreciate that. I appreciate your anger. I appreciate all the emotions you're having towards me. (laughs) Thank you for making it a safe space. Yeah, and fake until you make it. Speaking of like, you know, Mm. dumb slogans we've all bought into. But you are a linguist. I've never had a linguist on. So exploring cults through the lens of language is such an interesting approach. And I am a cult enthusiast. And I've never seen this this way in. So could you talk about like the moment you decided and this could bring in your background, which I'd love to hear about, too, with your father and your experience that way. But when were you like, oh, this is how I'm going to talk about cults? Yes. Well, um, like you, I have a lifelong fascination with fanatical fringe groups, supernatural belief, extreme behavior um, fueled by a charismatic leader, like all of this stuff. And that fascination was largely inspired by my dad, who spent his teenage years in a cult called Synanon against his will. Um, his father was a card-carrying communist, a pseudo-intellectual, someone who really wanted in on the blossoming countercultural movement of the late 60s. So when my dad was 14, he moved with his dad, his stepmom, his dad's new replacement family, onto what was promised to be this sort of socialist utopian compound that ended up being extremely conformist, destructive, traumatic, ultimately (sighs) violent. But my dad is a skeptical person up until that point he'd grown up in Manhattan's school of hard knocks you know he was very poor living with a single mom in Spanish Harlem New York he's an independent thinker he arrived at this place and he was like this seems like a cult (laughs) I'm I'm so glad I'm so glad he had that wherewithal and presence of mind at his age totally I mean I I don't actually think the word cult was in his mind at the time it was 1969 
the same year as the Manson family murders, nine years before the Jonestown massacre. So cults weren't really on the mainstream radar, you know, they weren't universally known as something we should all fear and avoid at all costs. But he saw the culture of conformity, how questioning was absolutely not allowed, how, you know, no one was allowed to work or go to school on the outside. He bore witness to these things and he thought, no, I got to get out of here as quickly as I can. And he actually did break some of the rules. He went to an outside school, which wasn't technically allowed and all this stuff. So anyway, he, he went on to thrive. He, yes. he, he went happy to a real, ending for dad. Yeah. Happy ending for dad. He, you know, went to a real high school. He got a diploma. He applied to the two nearest colleges. This was in the Bay Area, and on at the time. He applied to the two nearest schools. One was Chico State, the community college, and one was UC Berkeley. He got his UC Berkeley letter first, so he matriculated. Amazing. He got his PhD from UCLA, and now he's an acclaimed neuroscientist. <laughs> hey. We love to see it. <laughs> we love a redemption story. Yes. We do. But yeah, I grew up on my dad's stories. You know, I was always begging my parents, tell me a story, tell me a story. Not a story that was like some sort of made up fairy tale of princesses. I wanted to hear a true story. My dad, fortunately for me, had a lot of incredibly riveting true stories to tell. And I was so fascinated by his Sinanon story. And I think that it probably planted the seed of my love of nonfiction and journalism. You know, I really like cut my teeth on asking my dad, like, but why did that happen? And what did you do next? And trying to fill plot holes and such. But by far the most interesting part of my dad's stories to me was always the language, the special vocabulary that was used on Synanon's grounds to establish solidarity, to discourage dissent and questioning, to isolate folks from the outside world, to do everything that a cult needs to do in order to gain and maintain power. You know, for example, in Synanon, you didn't live with your parents. If you were a kid, you lived separate from them. So you didn't live with parents. You lived with PODs or parents on duty. You didn't go to a regular school. You went to the Synanon school and it was taught not by teachers, but demonstrators. If you joined Synanon because you had a drug problem, which was how the commune originally started as this alternative drug rehabilitation center, you were known as a dope fiend. But if you joined just because you wanted it on this alternative way of life, you were known as a lifestyler. There was this extremely disturbing ritual that everyone had to take place uh, that everyone had to participate in every single night where you would be divided into circles and forced to subject your peers to vicious interpersonal criticism sort of thing where you would call someone out and insult them and that person would have to just take it it was pitched as a sort of form of group therapy but really it was way of socially controlling people and extremely abusive and similar activities go on in all kinds of cultish groups even in amazon meetings employees are encouraged if not forced to skewer one another's ideas and they're just supposed to take it but this activity was called the game and it was referred to as something you played so this very emotionally loaded euphemism and those, those, that terminology, the acronyms, the special us versus them labels, all of that was so fascinating to me. And I grew up noticing Synanon-esque cultish language everywhere, like not just in stories of remote new religious communes, but in the theater program I was in in high school Mm -hmm. and the startup where I worked in my early 20s and the way that my friends, once I moved to LA, would talk about their moon circles or soul cycle. I just saw cultish influence showing up in the way that people spoke in all different corners of culture. And the idea to write cultish, the language of fanaticism sort of snapped into focus for me when I was chatting with one of my friends in early 2017 who had just started going to AA. And AA, for anyone who knows folks who, who, who are in recovery will know that they have an incredibly robust and catchy repertoire of stock phrases and acronyms. And it's not a bad thing. You right. know, cultish language, cultish participation doesn't have to be a bad thing, but it was clearly having an incredibly powerful effect on followers. So I thought, oh man, I have to write a book about the language of <laughs> cults, but not just cults like Heaven's Gate and the Mansons cults like multi-level marketing companies and social media gurus. I want to write about the wide spectrum of cults and how language works to influence followers, both for good and for ill. 
Yeah, so well said. And what I appreciate about your book is that you're not saying this means we have to be wary of any group or organization that has some particulars or some language associated just with their involvement, but it is good to be aware of it and not wary. And I thought that distinction was important because I think it's been so normalized to your point about startup culture. And I mean, who has an HR person anymore? It's a director of peoples and community. Now we want to make things sound more. What do you think it is? Cooler, exclusive? Well, Everybody likes the feeling of being part of an exclusive group and using a language that nobody else can understand. It's classic human tribalism. Everybody can remember, or I assume most people can remember what it felt like to learn pig Latin on the playground when you were a little kid. It's like you instantly are imbued with a sense of intellectual and moral superiority because you know how to use a code language that other people can't understand. So we really take language for granted because it's invisible and seemingly commitment free. Sticks and stones can break your bones, but words will never hurt you sort of thing. But really language can work incredibly powerfully to sway you, manipulate you in cultish ways even if it's something that you cannot see. And we have these preconceived notions that cults are these super sensational, freaky groups in the woods where everybody is brainwashed and has a shaved head and wears a white robe and is sort of like bowing down to some sort of wild-eyed creature. But cultural normativity really has so very much to do with what groups are considered cults and what groups are considered mainstream religions or accepted social groups. Like scholars have tried to come up with lists of criteria separating a cult from a religion, from another kind of ideologically bound group. You know, you have your charismatic leaders, your right. us-them dichotomies, your ends justify the means philosophies, your supernatural beliefs. You know, you can go down a list, but a lot of groups that could be called or have been called cults won't check off every box. And yet a lot of mainstream groups really will. So the this word cult has become so subjective, so judgment loaded, so alarmist in a lot of circumstances that it's not really enough to determine what specific dangers are on the table. And yet the word cult can still be useful because according to context, and you always need context mm-hmm. to make language meaningful, according to the context, it can mean a host of different things. And sometimes you really need to use the word in order to communicate the gravitas of uh, a certain destructive group, like Lularo is the most recent one. Ding, That's ding, in the ding. Yes. Yeah. But sometimes it's often just used as a judgment, like you're in a cult. No, you're in a cult. And it's not super useful. So it can mean something totally different depending on the conversation. Um, and and that's okay. Like language often means something different depending on the context. Absolutely. And I've had, I think three, well, I've had two cult survivors on and two cult experts. And none of them say the same thing when asked to define a cult. There's a lot of overlap, but it's subjective, like you're saying. But if I had to make you define it, if someone said, but in your own words, boil this down, distill cult down, like how would you describe it or define it, define it? Right. So I tend to define it by saying a spectrum of fanatical fringe groups that have a strong and pervasive ideology, but may or may not have a wide spectrum of negative effects on followers. Like that is such an unsatisfying definition because Again, this word is so very subjective that I don't really feel comfortable, like definitively quantifying. I know. Right, right. But yeah, I would say I would say it is a a at any kind of fanatical group, really. And some of them are really dangerous and some of them are mostly harmless. But the word cult is not enough to tell you which is which. Right. And I also love that you go into the origins of the word cult, which I've never stopped to think about, but of course it would come from cultivate. So can you talk a little bit about the actual linguistic origins of cult? Sure. Yeah. Well, you're right. Cult, cultivate culture. These all come from the same Latin root. In writings from, I believe it was the 16th century, earliest forms of the word cult can be found with a much more innocent meaning, simply 
homage paid to divinity or offerings made to win over the gods. And then over the next couple hundred years, it evolved to mean a sort of churchly classification alongside religion or sect. It denoted something alternative, but not necessarily nefarious. Mm -hmm. It really wasn't until the 20th century, the mid 20th century, when the emergence of different alternative and new religions, different from Protestantism or you know, any of the accepted religions at the time started emerged, that old school conservative conservatives and Christians got scared. And so then the word cult became associated with heretics, quacks, freaks, kooks. But again, it wasn't this mainstream fear. It wasn't on the average American's radar as something we should all be terrified of, that we should all know about. Not until the Manson murders and the Jonestown massacre garnered this incredible incredible press, which really sensationalized and dehumanized the folks involved with those tragedies. Then, of course, you had the 1980s satanic panic wave yeah. when everybody was super paranoid that there were these like cabals of Satan worshiping child abusers, like plaguing American suburban, you know, like there have been these waves of cult interest and cult phobia but it really wasn't until less than 100 years ago that our sort of modern understanding of cult emerged. So interesting. And there is always this cultural, societal overreaction to those big, mm. big stories that pop up. It, you know, it seems like every decade almost has one. When you said that it dehumanized the people involved in those stories, did you mean the members of the cult and the leader or the victims or, or everybody? I think kind of everybody. Yeah, you know? interesting. I mean, well, our our interpretation of cult leaders is that they are these evil masterminds, these geniuses with a plan from the beginning to like brainwash and destroy people. But they're not. <laughs> That's an outlier. I think that might exist, but I don't think it's the it's it the might. exception, not the norm. Correct. These folks are opportunists. Mm -hmm. who set out with a promise that they truly believe will solve the world's most urgent problems. Like, why would anybody be attracted to a leader who was promising, like, evil and destruction? You know, e even Jonestown, the People's Temple, the most notorious cult of all time, started out as an integrationist church. I mean, these, th these, these groups tend to start out, like, Pretty, pretty harmless or even positive. Yes. And then as more people become attracted to the group, the leader becomes more power hungry. And maybe they do have some personality disorder or megalomania. I don't know. I think it's different from cult leader to cult leader, but they become fueled by that power. They chase the power, however it manifests, however fast it comes. And a lot of them, most of them, don't have the restraint to scale back or reevaluate before things spin out of control and become violent before it's too late. So definitely like a thirst for power is a common thread from cult leader to cult leader. But again, like this is something that you'll see with most Silicon Valley CEOs. What is it like? It's like one in five CEOs has been found to be a psychopath. Like clinically. Right. So yeah, I mean, we think of them as these evil geniuses but they're not exactly that, or they tend not to be exactly that. But more importantly, our stereotypes of cult followers are that they are desperate, disturbed, intellectually deficient, brainwashed, mind-controlled minions. But again, why would a cult want someone like that? Right, they want right. someone who is bright and service-oriented and well-connected, who has you know, a network of people to tap that so that they'll become involved, who have money to spare, who have the sort of idealism and in a lot of ways privilege that when things inevitably turn sour, they're not going to break down right away. Right. What I found interviewing so many cult survivors is that they were not desperate necessarily. They were vulnerable for one reason or another, whether it was because they were part of a marginalized group or because um, they didn't feel like the groups that had once provided support 
the government, the traditional church, et cetera, had abandoned them. They were vulnerable in one way or another, but, but that alone does not make you susceptible to this kind of nefarious influence. Really the common thread was this overabundance of optimism. Yes. This, like almost delusional faith that like this group holds the answers to these incredibly urgent problems. And by affiliating with this group, you can be a part of that change. That takes a lot of optimism to, to get on board with. And right. so that's what I found from Heaven's Gate survivors to Jonestown survivors to diehard soul cyclers. It was idealism more yes. than anything. Well, I know you reference Frank Byford in your book, and he's been on the podcast. And mm. what an interesting story he has for every reason, but also given his stutter. I don't know if you spoke with him in person, but he attributes did, that yeah. to his time in Heaven's Gate. I mean, talk about a mind-body connection. The suppression of thought and freedom of speech so to the point where he has a hard time still like with speech really blew me away. That was um, unexpected because I didn't know he had that when I until I met him and we talked. So me that's neither. incredible. But everything you're saying, I'm just shouting inside like, yes, it's a seeker. I feel like a cult member is often a person who sees a vision of the world that is better than the one that they're in and they want to help cultivate it. And so I appreciate that perspective. But before we go too far past cult leaders, I don't want to brush by that because again, I also agree about Jim Jones. He had a kind of attractive message in his moment yeah. culturally and bringing, you know, integrating the church and then everything else transpired. So I have a crazy theory and I've like posited this before to people. I've gotten some eyebrows askew, <laughs> but I feel like a lot of cult leaders might be misguided artists or had they found a lot of success elsewhere, they may have not turned to destruction and ruining people's lives. Manson, for example, just wanted to be a singer. And he got so close with the Beach Boys. I'm serious. And he was good, but also he was deranged in his own way, of course. But he got to record with the Beach Boys and his version of their song. I know I'm really going specifically here, but like it's better than the Beach Boys version, in my humble opinion. So I'm just like Charlie Manson, if he'd become a household name, like a singer, would his story have been so different? And then you can flip it, like you said, like what what CEO isn't doesn't have that or, or a super big celebrity? My name is John Lorden, and I've been looking into hundreds of unsolved mysteries over the past five years on my YouTube channel, Lorden Arts. And I've been known to bring a respectful, victim-focused approach to the stories that I cover while donating thousands of dollars directly to those cases and the charities that help them. Now, I'm bringing that approach and sensibility, along with some of the biggest mysteries I've ever looked into, and some new ones, to a weekly podcast called Seriously Mysterious. From bizarre occurrences to unsolved murders and unexplainable disappearances, everything is fair game on this show as long as it's seriously mysterious. You can find Seriously Mysterious on your favorite podcatchers or by visiting seriouslymysterious.com. Let's look into the mysterious together. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I think you might be onto something here that uh, cult leaders maybe are misfits yeah. in one way or another. I think a lot of really violent people felt misunderstood throughout their childhood, their life. And so they wake up and choose violence. But where did that little phrase come from? That I don't so know, funny. but it works in so many places. Now it and I'm really, grateful for it, it really does. <laughs> I like it a lot. I wonder where that comes from. Probably sometime in 2020, someone, someone wrote that somewhere and it's just, we've all taken it. Yeah. Although, you know, we find time after time when we look into the etymology of slang that like, we think it was invented on TikTok, but really it was invented by like black folks in the fifties. <laughs> You're probably absolutely right. I would yeah. like to get to the bottom of this. Right. But yeah, no, I, I mean, I talk about in my book, about how having big dreams makes you yes. vulnerable to sort of wild ideas. Definitely, you'll find that people who strike up with groups like Scientology and oh, Nexium, sure. there is definitely an overrepresentation of artists in the groups themselves. I mean, dreaming that you could become as famous as Tom Cruise 
is not that different from dreaming that you could achieve a paradise afterlife. Like right. celebrities are gods on earth as far as Westerners are concerned. Right. So yes, I think having big artistic dreams can certainly be correlated with having sort of like supernatural delusions. Yeah. I mean, like, ugh, I never talk about this, but I started out in college as a theater major. I did too. <laughs> oh, okay. Sure. We should band together and start. Come to think of it. I, I'm too lazy to that, but <laughs> <laughs> or not too lazy, but I just don't like managing people. This exactly. is why I can't have a job. But anyway, yeah. So I found the NYU theater program to be unbelievably cultish. I found the people in it to be just delusional. I'm like, let me get this straight. You all think you're going to be famous because that's not going to happen. And I... And then I turned back, I turned that back on myself and I was like, shit, you're not going to be the famous actor <laughs> right. The statistics don't bear out for you either. Yeah. I'm just like, this is not going to work out for you either, bitch. So <laughs> I got out of there nice and quick. But I do remember thinking like, who better to manipulate in a cultish way than theater kids? <laughs> they were, they were like, they were misfits, you know, right, they were like right. the weird kids in middle school and high school, although I also went to a theater uh, performing arts high school but there they were like the misfits who also had these like big dreams totally. and so you're looking for a community you're looking for a sense of transcendence mm -hmm. you're looking for ritual of course like these are all things that humans crave fundamentally but that I think like theater kids crave on an extra extreme level so yeah I was just like I cannot be a part of the cult of the NYU theater department I must go become a linguistics major. <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. That's amazing. That actually didn't, it, I mean, it's sort of interestingly mirroring your dad's experience and maybe I'm sure that informed your, your little radar for that. Obviously oh, totally. not a cult or a destructive organization, but you just even on the spectrum, on the spectrum, on the spectrum and you didn't want to be a part of it. And so you were just no. able to identify that for yourself and then adjust. Well, the red flag for me was this group is taking up all of my time. It's right. taking up my entire life. Like if you're an NYU theater major, if you're yeah. a freshman anyway, you can't take other classes. Your right. schedule is completely co-opted. They control you psychologically. They control how you dress. I mean, you have to wear all black in the theater department. It's yeah. encouraging this conformity. It felt like military school, but also kindergarten. Like I just <laughs> didn't feel like an independent adult. And I was like, I want to learn to speak more foreign languages. Like I'm in college. Yeah. I want to learn things that I can't learn anywhere else. This just feels like it's controlling me in a way that I do not consent to. So I left and then, yeah, I explored a lot of different things before I settled on linguistics. Um, but yeah, I just didn't feel like I had a sense of independence. I didn't feel like I had a sense of choice. Wow. And I think that's how my dad felt in a much more like a high stakes context. Sure, sure. But yeah, no, I was totally, I mean, I was brought up in a household of scientists. So I was brought up to question that every challenge. Time. Yeah. Bear, test out that theories. Said, yeah. That said, even I am susceptible to cultish influence. Like you like to tell yourself, no, I'm too smart. I'm too skeptical. Like I would never be involved in a cultish group. But I argue in my book that a toxic one-on-one -on -one relationship mm. is really just a cult of one. <laughs> and a lot yeah. of the techniques of manipulation, conditioning, coercion, all of that are very similar. I mean, I also argue in my book that cults exist on social media and that certain influencers who are no longer peddling just like eye cream and vacations, but like really high stakes things like social justice and spirituality and all the rest they can have a cultish influence on you. And I've totally found myself susceptible to, to that yeah. sort of thing. So yeah, I'm, I'm not above it. I am, even I am not above it. <laughs> well, that's a relief to hear. And I've been really vulnerable on this podcast, but if I had gotten an invitation to a Nexium meeting before knowing everything we know now at a certain time of my life, I absolutely would have said yes. Would mm -hmm. I have bought the course and gone all the way through? I don't know. I don't think so. But I for sure would have gone to like an info session. Absolutely. Uh -huh. I know I would have for a lot of different reasons. I would have because I'm a supportive friend. So if a friend had asked me, I'd go. I'm a curious person. You know, I do what I, I like self-improvement stuff. And there was that, you know, period sure. in my 20s where I was like, 
I would be the best version of myself. And if you were a theater kid, like Ugh. there are a lot of actors. And it would have been an actor. Absolutely. That would have been mm-hmm. recruiting me. So, so I'm, I'm really, I'm really glad actually that there's now a new conversation around members of cults that we're not shaming them so much. I mean, we still do. People do. But I really don't like that conversation where people, how could she and what were they thinking? Why didn't they leave? I mean, it sounds so much to me like the way we talk about women in assault situations or abusive relationships. And I think Mm -hmm. that that tide is shifting and I'm I'm happy to see it. But on a lighter note, we we skimmed over and I want to go back MLMs and Lula Rich in particular. I just had the directors on. So this is perfect timing. In your book, you wrote an MLM is just a pyramid scheme that hasn't gotten caught. True story. Do you think by design, they're just inevitably going to bottom out? Yeah. 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 I mean, (laughs) like studies show that up to 99% of MLM recruits never make a dime. And yet what you're being promised is this grandiose life where you could possibly become a millionaire. And the promises don't simply have to do with money, but your entire life, you're doing something fundamentally patriotic by being a part of this organization. You're benefiting your family, you're pleasing God. I mean, there's a reason why so many MLMs are Christian or Mormon affiliated. They preach a version of the prosperity gospel, this idea that heavenly blessings and monetary hashtag blessings are connected. The, I mean, the classic cult red flag of of an MLM, the legally loopholed fraternal twin of the pyramid scheme is that they are love bombing you with this incredibly lofty, language of a once in a lifetime opportunity to be an entrepreneur, be the boss babe you were always meant to be, to make a full-time living with part-time work from home. I mean, they're really exploiting fundamental American values that we're all brought up with, individualism, progress, ambition, self-improvement, meritocracy, the idea that those who achieve success really deserve it and those who don't simply didn't work hard enough. Like we're all brought up with these values and MLMs take them to an extreme. So they make these incredible promises, knowing all the while that the math just doesn't check out. Anyone who's familiar with with how MLMs operate, eventually, unless you're at the lucky tippity top of that pyramid, you're, you're going to lose out. And yet the psychological manipulation and gaslighting that has been put in place is such that it's going to be hard for you to leave because you're clinging to this promise that if you just work hard enough, if you just put in enough time, effort, grit, heart, like you will succeed. And if you start to feel like you won't, well, that's just a victim mindset. You yeah. Know, you, oh, yeah. They've got buzzwords for that, too. Yeah, exactly. So I think it's an incredibly predatory industry. That's not just your average financial scam, but is much more all consuming, missionary, ideological. It's it's pretty akin to a cult. Well, there's also a footnote in your book right here parenthetically you write though i'd actually argue the multi-level marketing giant amway is more of a threat to society than nexium ever was please Mm -hmm. elaborate because i I think i know what you mean there but and i think it's to what you're speaking to right now but can you say more sure okay well so keith ranieri was just like an independent person he was also a failed pyramid scheber oh yes he was uh (laughs) consumer byline never forget Yes. (laughs) yes never forget but He was not particularly well connected. He was just sort of like this individual trying to do a thing. And that thing was incredibly destructive for those involved. But the tentacles didn't really reach very far. Amway, by contrast, is the biggest MLM in the world. It was founded partially by a member of the DeVos family, the billionaire Michigan family that is also responsible for giving us Betsy DeVos. Yep. This incredibly conservative family that has super strong political ties in Washington that donates incredible sums of money to Republican presidential candidates and other Republican politicians coffers. So they are not only abusive toward the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people who get involved. It's a way bigger organization than Nexium, but they're also having an effect on everyone who lives in this country and people who live outside of this country as well. So the like maximum danger of Amway might not be you getting branded, you being manipulated into having sex with the people at the top. Like that's not necessarily on the table, but 
you becoming bankrupt, yep. becoming isolated from everyone else on the outside, being psychologically fucked. Um, and, and, you know, even if you're not even in the organization, having your political system orchestrated in part by this group, that's on the table. And for those reasons, I would argue that Amway um, is in a way even more, <laughs> even, even scarier than it's, Nexium. Right. It's so far reaching. I mean, Nexium at its peak, at its height, probably had like 16,000 students take those courses, right? And, and right. DOS, the sex circle, 24 people, you know, yeah. huge terrible destruction. Oh, terrible. They, they terrible. are going to have that trauma for a long, long time. But yes, Amway's potential for destruction is so far reaching. And Amway is protected. Amway is protected yeah. by yeah. all of these close political ties. Whereas like Keeper Neary didn't have friends in particularly high places. Like, yeah, he hung out for the Dalai Lama for two seconds, but the Dalai Lama isn't getting money from Keeper Neary, or like he did for that one appearance. Yeah. But like, <laughs> That they're not, I mean, no one's going to really go to bat for Keith Raniere. That's why he's in prison. Like he was able to be taken down way more easily than Amway ever, ever would. Like Amway will never be taken down. And that's right. why I regard it as, I mean, really, I'm just highlighting that cultural normativity element to how we interpret the word cult. It's like, oh yeah, like Nexium is a cult because they're branding women and they're sex trafficking, yada, yada. But Amway isn't a cult because it's legal and because right. we all know someone who's involved. It's like, no, 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 no. That doesn't make it not a cult. It's still a cult. It's just one that has really powerful ties and that has established itself as something we should all accept. Right. And MLMs in general, and I don't, I mean, I guess probably Amway, but particularly ones like Lula Rowe and ones that seem to target women and new moms, to me, reveal this very broken part of our society that we have not fixed. And it's this idea of like how a woman returns to work and gets great options and fair pay and there's no paternal leave for, for the fathers. And so it feels like this very sloppy solution that's like this low hanging fruit. And it feels sometimes like all we get. Well, it's super predatory. I mean, ever since, like the direct sales industry and its modern iteration has always targeted primarily non-working wives and mothers. Yeah. And that has to do with like women leaving the workforce after World War II when their husbands returned from war. They were sort of like pushed back into the kitchen, if yep. you will. Yep. And they lost that sense of community and empowerment they got, that they got while they were working. These are mostly white women also. And they, you know, and then in comes Tupperware. <laughs> right, right. And it's like, here's an opportunity to connect with other women and to own your own business. Like these were things that these women were really, really craving. And that this doomed organization, or at least doomed for the people who get involved, were, were really exploiting. Oh, it makes me kind of sad and, and, and angry, but both. It makes me both. Same. Okay. So Dr. Yanya Lalich was on, and she talks about how cults tailor their message for their audience, right? So Heaven's Gate is going to be for the person who will, always has believed in UFOs and that there's life on other planets. That's not going to be me. I'm not going to go to their info session. <laughs> We've gone close, but like, really, where do you think, yeah, if I were to get suckered into a first meeting, it would be probably this group. And it could be actual like cult or, or a group. I was actually thinking about this a lot the other day after I watched Lula Rich because mm -hmm. those leggings, I don't want to yuck anyone's yum, but like those leggings would not get me. You know Absolutely. I mean? There's no black ones. I'm sorry. Unicorn donut leggings would not wear. However, if there was a cult that was roping me in with soft table knit pastel colored <laughs> turtlenecks, for example, and puffy sleeved crop tops. Oh, I love a statement sleeve. Me too. And it took place on like a tiny house compound <laughs> for women and non binary people only. And they were promising that you would get the opportunity to like really explore your most artistic self. It was like this sort of retreat. I'm actually starting, I'm actually trying to start <laughs> something just like this. <laughs> You're like, this is a perfect segue to a ground floor opportunity for your audience. Yes, yes exactly. But I'm just saying like, there is a cult for everyone. I'm Absolutely. looking for one. Listen, <laughs> the things that I stand, no one has developed a cult around. 
which is unfortunate because it looks like a blast. Yeah. So (laughs) talk about the upside. There's an upside, right? You find your people. Oh yeah. You find your people. You feel less alone in this confounding, entropic, doomed universe. Like we're all just trying to bear human existence and other people and sometimes spiritual beliefs can help us do that. And I think that that's a great thing. I think when someone at the top exploits that and harms other people in the process, that is not a great thing. It's the worst thing. Yeah. So. Oh, well, stay tuned about the soft crop top artistic compound and she sheds. I'm so intrigued. The, yeah. The statement sleeve tiny house retreat is coming. I'm uh, Sign me up. Of all the heavy hitting cults, like the big guys, which one mm. is the most compelling to you in terms of the research that you did? Like, which cult could you just really lose yourself in the research and you find just kind of aesthetically or time period wise, just super fascinating. Heaven's gate. Yeah. A hundred percent. Isn't it crazy that it was in the nineties? It's so crazy to me. This was the first cult that I think I was really aware of because I was like five when it made headlines little baby 90s 90s baby yeah so yes I love the sort of like 90s sci-fi aesthetic that's why there's a UFO on my book cover yeah I really think it's such fun how they would use language to create this sort of sci-fi universe for themselves in their mansion in Southern California so it's like they would refer to the kitchen as the neutral lab and the laundry room as the fiber lab and if they were in the kitchen it was in craft but if they were out in the world they were out of craft like whoa so fun I didn't so fun. Know I mean that. awful terrible terrible destructive awful tragic but aesthetically thematically we stand kind of cool so what do you make this is a true crime conundrum if in my opinion I was doing a little bit of research and saw that you can get those 1994 Nikes on eBay for like 1200 bucks is that tacky and wrong or is that like well hey there's everyone's a no no something. no those, those Nike decades are like a back in style I, I don't think they're the exact model but like black and white but Nikes. I'm pretty sure these were being hawked as like oh, heaven's I gate esque yeah right? no I know <laughs> actually there is a pair there are pairs that are like exactly from that era that you can get on eBay for, I think, up to six grand. So as a collector's item, I've actually talked to several people about this because it's the same thing as like wanting to have a first edition of L. Ron Hubbard's Dianetics. It's right, like, right. Ooh, like, it makes me feel it, some kind of way. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, ooh, that's a little, ooh, ooh. I, it's like not as bad as owning Nazi paraphernalia because it's historical, but it's like, it's on its it, way there. It's moving in the direction. Yeah. But I think at the same time, it's like, I am wearing a long white gown in my author photo, like on the cultish book jacket, which is sort of an homage to the first cult that I address in the book, which is 3HO, the Happy Healthy Holy Organization, aka the Kundalini Yogis. So it's like, I'm kind of doing that. I do love like a 70s, late 60s, like Manson girl aesthetic. I don't know. I feel very cognitively dissonant about it. But yeah, no, I mean, these things are really intriguing to us for a reason. And yeah, it's weird, like having an obsession with cult paraphernalia. It has this like vintage, stylish cachet to it at this point that I feel... I guess, fine about. (laughs) Okay, good. No, I'm glad we landed on a a conclusive place. And I think it is different than, say, true crime straight paraphernalia. Like that can be, Mm -hmm. or even like if I were going to Boulder, I always think about this. I don't know why. I've never been to Colorado. Would I go by the John JonBenet Ramsey house just to see it? I kind of think I would. But I wouldn't take a picture and I wouldn't post it. Like that's, I think, like that line to me. I'm I'm willing to go right up to it. But then I, I, in my head, that's where it's crossed. But like. So we're, so we're attracted to these stories, not because we're like perverted voyeurs, but because on some level we're scanning for threats because we, like our brains want to know whether or not this thing is a threat to us of course it's not but it's the same thing that our brains do when we see a car crash we cannot help but look yes it's not because we are freaks who are inexplicably attracted to darkness and death we're like is this a threat to me is this a threat to me and so that's really deeply ingrained 
I don't necessarily, I don't think it's really harming anyone to drive by the Jean Benet Ramsey house. But yes, it would be harming someone to like make light of it in a social media post. Right. I Um, think that is the crossover, but this is all highly subjective. And that's where this stuff gets tricky. People who wear t-shirts with serial killer faces on it, to me, it's like a no go, like just not cool. Don't like it. Well, I mean, like serial killers and cult leaders all have groupies. Absolutely. It's called hybristophilia. Yes, you have that term in your book. I was so happy to see that. (laughs) Yeah. So I don't know. I I think when taken to an extreme, it's probably like a really not so great thing. But just having the fascination and and approaching it, like reading the room a little bit with it. Yes. Yeah. Reading the room's never a bad idea. Yeah, just read that old room. Read that old room. Amanda, I could talk to you about cults all day, and I hope maybe we'll get to another day, some other time. But before I let you go, I ask all my guests a closing question, and it's a different one every season. And this season, the question is, it's your last night on Earth. Maybe the UFO is coming tonight. Maybe tomorrow it's over. I don't know. But what would your final meal be? If you could just eat one more tonight, what would you eat? I think it would be, sorry, there's a... UFO oh, overhead there it is. coming for me now. They got their cue. Marshall Applewhite, get away. <laughs> I think if it had to be my last night on earth, it would probably be like my favorite meal that my mom makes. So um, she makes something called the yummy pasta, Aww. which is just like a really delicious sun-dried tomato basil cheesy pasta mm, thing comfort and yeah and her like very fudgy homemade brownies made from scratch maybe also like some authentic new york style pizza by the slice <laughs> yes yeah that's a great answer that's really good well i love that answer and i've really really enjoyed having you on dialogue thank you so much for killing the small talk i will make sure to link to your book cultish the language of fanaticism and your podcast sounds like a cult thank you thanks amanda dialogue is a yellow tape media production audio engineered by jason usry and produced hosted and edited by me, Rebecca Sebastian. If you love the podcast, please consider becoming a diehard by signing up at patreon.com slash dialogue. Other ways to support the show? Follow along on social media. We are at Dialogue Pod across platforms, and you can now watch most episodes on YouTube by subscribing to my channel, Rebecca Sebastian. For more information or to drop me a note, visit RebeccaSebastian.com. Until next time, thank you for listening and killing the small talk.